Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, we'll just write this guy up. So our is found linearly currently takes in a value we're searching for, a list in which we're searching, and it goes through and it returns the position in that list where it's first found, right? So what we were supposed to do is we're supposed to uh, modify this guy so that it returns the last place it's found, okay? So we could do this, uh, well, probably the easiest way to do this is to walk from the end of the list towards the beginning of the list, right? Because the first time we find it starting at the end will be the last time it's found in the list. All right, so remember last time we looked at the, uh, the couple different um, loops, we, we, we kind of recognize that we've always been using a for each loop in Python at this point because all the counting ones we've done have been using that range function, which is saying for i is in this collection of numbers. Well, now we introduce, well, what if I want to go through every element in a list? That's fine, but one problem you run into then is what if you uh, um, uh, need to access the individual positions within the list? Okay, so going through every element in the list with a for each loop like this, like we have here, where this variable list val is equal to each element of the list each time through here. So it would be bucket zero, then bucket one, then bucket two, then bucket three, but the actual value within the list instead of that index, instead of zero, one, two, three. Um, when we use the for each loop like that, we don't get the index. And we really need the index in this case because we wanted to know what the last occurrence was. We faked it last time when we were looking for the first occurrence by giving ourselves pause. Now, the issue we have here is we don't have a mechanism uh, and I actually suspect one might exist actually, but I don't know what it is off the top of my head. But so let's just assume we don't have one, at least it's not something I'm going to teach you. We don't have a mechanism of going through every element of our list backwards. You know, right now our for each in list, you know, this for each loop goes through forwards always. All right. So we need to revert back to our old counting way of going through things in a list by using a range starting at the last legal bucket, going all the way to the first legal bucket, which is bucket zero, stepping by negative one. Remember that guy? Okay, so our go through a collection of stuff in reverse loop. So here, I'll actually just write a second one. So we'll say uh, def um, last index of val in list. Here, let me elevate that for some of you if you're taking notes. Okay, so we don't need to keep track of pause here, so uh, because we're not going to use the normal for each loop, so we're going to say for i in range, we want to start at the last legal bucket in list, which is the length of list minus one. We want to go all the way up to, but not including, um, well, we want to go all the way up to and including the first legal bucket, which is zero. So we need to go up to negative one non-inclusive. And we want to step by negative one. All right. So if our list had five things in it, we would start I off at five, go all the way up to, but not including negative one, I guess this way. Uh, whatever. <laughs> All the way up to, but not including negative one. So this would go from four, so five minus one, four to zero inclusive, stepping by minus one each time. So we go from four to three to two to one to zero, including zero. Then when we hit the negative one, we're done. Okay. So this should step us, this should take an eye on that voyage. All right. And if we just print that off real quick, let's just just as a review from last time, we'll go ahead and print out just I, and I'll pass it a list, and it should print out the last legal bucket and I all the way down to zero, including zero. Just those numbers, so we know we're visiting those uh, those buckets of our of our list. So this guy's called last index of. All right, so this list has uh, six things in it, so it should go from five to zero. That's the numbers we should see, five, four, three, two, one, zero, showing us that this loop is walking our list backwards, or at least giving us those indexes. Oh, 
Oh, it's on my desktop, right? So there's our five, four, three, two, one. It did print out. Where did that none come from? Oh, 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 thank you. <laughs> this guy doesn't return anything yet. Okay, so I'm printing out the value that this returns. See, good, I was testing you and you passed. Yeah. This guy's printing out the value that our uh, function returns here, and right now my function doesn't return anything. So that's why it's printing out none. It's saying, okay, I'll, I'll do my best. All right, we will be returning something shortly. All right, but we saw that this guy did count down from five, four, three, two, one to zero. All right, so now each time through, we want to check is the current element we're looking at the guy we're looking for. So if list at bucket i, if that guy is equivalent to val, oh, that's not this language. <laughs> Go ahead and return i. Perfect. Okay. Otherwise, keep trucking, right? And if we get all the way to the beginning and never find it, we'll return a negative one. That makes sense? All right. So we are searching for a 74 in this list. So if we had a, um, so right now a 74 is located, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it's located at five. It's also located at three. We would want this version of last index of to return the five the position in that list where 74 last occurs. Okay, so let's see if this guy gives us our five. There's our five. All right, if we ask for a, we'll do a 15, this should give us a four, it only appears in there one time anyways. So there's our four. And let's look for a 75, which does not appear. So that should give us a negative one because it searches from the end all the way to the beginning, never finds it and says, okay, we break out of this loop. You know, we've naturally ended the loop here and we'll go ahead and return negative one. So there's our negative one. All right, so this was a reasonable solution for the homework assignment. Um, that was probably the simplest solution. If you try to, uh, um, one thing you could have done, if you didn't consider going through it forwards, or, or didn't consider going through it backwards rather, is let's go ahead and modify this guy up here to do it, let's call it the, the hard way, all right? So rather than when we find our winner, we go ahead and return it immediately, what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're going to have a variable maybe called current winner, okay? And we'll say current winner um, starts off as negative one. So when we find a value there, we'll go ahead and say current winner is equal to pause. All right, every single time we find it, we update current winner. So if we found it at bucket three, and then again at bucket five, cur winner will eventually be a five. We'll overwrite that three with a five, okay? So we're still checking everything in our list. We're going from the beginning all the way to the end, checking every single bucket guaranteed, okay? Keeping track of my current position, the current winner of where the guy I'm searching for lives, okay? The first time I find him, that might be my winner, but if I find him later in the list, I'll replace that position with this new with this new value. All right, so then in the end, we'll just always return cur winner. If we never found it, cur winner started off at negative one. So we would return a negative one in the end. Otherwise, if we found it at least once, cur winner will be equal to the position where we found it. If we found it more than once, cur winner will be equal to the last place we found it. Does that make sense? All right, so this code 
functionally, uh, well, actually, functionally, yeah, functionally is fine. Functionally does uh, the same thing as this code down here. <laughs> hypothetically, are we back to that? That was this class, right? The hypothetically and the theoretically and all that stuff. Okay. So these two functions both do the same thing right now. They just accomplish it in two different ways. All right. Um, why is this version more efficient? They both get the right answer. They both get the right answer. And for us, that's good enough. Right? For us in here, it's good enough. And actually, for most of us, 10 years from now, it's good enough. I don't care if you're already working in industry for five years. Nobody's impressed if you write code that nobody else can read. Write stuff that you understand. Okay? So, and every now and then, you'll actually have to pay attention to the efficiency of something and say, oh, okay, well, this part needs to be a little faster. All right. Why is this faster than this? Let's go with him first. So you put his hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a really, really long list. It starts at any, so it doesn't go through every single number until it finds that last one. Okay, so this guy here is guaranteed 100% of the time to check every single bucket in our list. Correct? This guy down here only checks every single bucket of the list in what situation? If it's not in the list. If the thing we're looking for wasn't found. Otherwise, as soon as it hits the first occurrence of it, it knows that's the last occurrence of it because it started at the end. It doesn't have to keep track of the current winner or anything and check the rest of the buckets. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, do you think we would notice uh, from a human being's perspective a difference in speed between this top one and this bottom one, you'd have to get a pretty big list for us to start noticing as a person. And we're talking a really big list, not like a thousand. Millions and millions, possibly even billions. I mean, this computer is pretty quick, so a lot. <laughs> All right, so this would not be what's known as a time complexity problem. So this type of, oh, that's interesting. This type of problem here um, isn't mathematically complex to the point that we really need to worry about it too much until the data set we're working with becomes just ridiculous. Okay? So, and at the point when you're working with a ridiculously sized data set, you'll know a lot more than you know now, and you'll be able to say, okay, well, I need to be careful here. <laughs> I don't want to look through 10 billion things if I only have to look through six. All right? So... You know, that's the, that's the punchline. But for us, either one of these solutions is, uh, is adequate. Um, questions about this? Make some reasonable sense? All right. So, remember, we were talking about searching. And um, one of the, so we, we, we talked about the, uh, um, you know, if we were just, uh, if I gave you a, a deck of cards that had numbers on them, I told you to search through there, you would just start flipping through the cards. Well, I think he had the solution of throwing it in the air and grabbing it in the air like a magic trick type thing, right? But generally, we'd flip through it, looking for the card we're interested in and, and find it. That's a linear search. Not the most efficient thing, but it gets the job done. And we can expect that a computer can probably flip through those cards faster than we can, and the computer's not going to miss you know, sometimes two cards stick together for us. So, you know, computer's not going to screw up like we might. All right. So a linear search isn't necessarily considered to be bad. Um, like we just talked about, it is inefficient. You know, if we're measuring it against, you know, this is a, you know, a bicycle compared to a Ferrari. Okay. It's inefficient from that perspective. But at the same time, it's also simple to write. Correct? I mean... It's a simple task in real life. You know, usually it would, it, these two would equate. In real life, if I handed you a deck of cards and I told you just to flip through there and tell me if a card is found, that's a simple task to, to do, right? It might be a little tedious, but it's not difficult. Okay. What might be another way for you to find that card? A less simple way, but maybe a more efficient way. Once you actually get to the searching. Let me kind of push you in the right direction. Let's say, uh, as if we use these anymore, um, 
Let's say you are looking for a uh, phone number for uh, Zephyros in the phone book. Hey, do you start at page one of the phone book and start flipping through until you find Zephyros? You don't. Why not? Okay. I was, I was hoping everybody in here has at least used the phone book. <laughs> is this just something we've heard of, or has everybody in here used the phone book? We're, we're about there, aren't we? Yeah, because nobody uses we. You just Google, right? You Google it, or you you open up the you know the Maps app and just find out what places to eat are around you, and they pop up, and you just click the little phone button. <laughs> it says call. Right. Okay, so you're looking for Zephyros, and he says they're sorted. So this book, this phone book, is in order. So we know the Z's are near the end, correct? So what do you do when you first open that book? Now, chances are you're not going to hit the exact page, are you? You might luck out, but you, you know that Zephyros, near the end of the alphabet, going to be close to the back, right? But we don't necessarily know how many Z's there were, so you know we're going to kind of guess. We're going to flip to some page near the end of the book, right? Near the end of the phone book. Then what are we going to do? After you get to that page, so we're kind of stumbling upon the algorithm here. Once we get to that page, then what do we what do we do? How do we know whether we're on the right page or not? Hmm. Okay, so so kind of look where we are in the alphabet, right? So get an idea where we are in the alphabet. Am I too soon or am I too late? Okay, that's the idea. So if I'm too soon, then I'm going to go a couple pages further, right? As a human being, we can kind of, now we can really dial it in, right? Because we're, we're smart. We can say, look, I'm, I'm too soon, but only by like a page. So I'll just flip one page and we're good. We're, we're smart things. We're smart people. So um, computers, we have to make a more generic algorithm for this. So we might say, okay, well, I guessed that it was going to be on this page. Maybe we open the book to the middle, okay? So you open the phone book to the exact middle. Then you point to the middle element on that page. This is, again, knowing that our data is sorted. We point to the middle element on that page and we say, is this the guy I'm looking for? Okay. If it is, great. We're done. We found it. If it's not, then what do we do? We decide, does it come before this word or does it come after this word? If it comes before this word, we tear the book in half, we throw away the, the right half, and then we flip to the center of what's left point in the middle of it. Is this the word I'm looking for? Yes, no. Which half is it in? Rip it in half. Throw the half it's not in out. Turn to the center. Rinse, lather, repeat until you finally land on the word or you run out of pages. Make sense? Okay. But all of that. Now, that kind of seems tedious, and as a human being, you you probably wouldn't, uh, you know, we've discussed that we're pretty smart, so we can kind of jump later or earlier in the phone book, depending on where we kind of guess where that it will be. But as a general algorithm, we can turn to, let's call it close to the middle. Okay, you pick a spot in the middle, and then you can just repeat this until you finally land on the, the value you're looking for. Okay? But it does require that our data be sorted. So that algorithm, even though it maybe seems a little tedious, if you were to perform the generic version of it on a real phone book, it wouldn't take you that long, right? It would take you far less checks to find Zephyros than if you went, did a linear search through a phone book. Okay. As you're going through all the A's and all the B's and all the C's until you finally get late in the alphabet when you knew that's where you were going to begin with. And that's what you'd have to do if the phone book was not sorted, right? You would just have to kind of browse <laughs> to try to find Zephyros. So having it sorted is important. But now I've given you that deck of cards with numbers on it. Now they have to be sorted. How are you going to sort that guy? Because we can't do this. this. This search I just introduced here is something called a binary search. Uh, let's get Keynote open up here. Is 200. Binary search. Sometimes this guy is called a dictionary search, but let's call it the, the formal name for it is a binary search. Okay? But it works like a dictionary or a phone book, right? For finding, finding stuff. 
All right, so we could just say works like a dictionary or phone book. Requires the data be sorted. All right, so now I've handed you a deck of cards with some numbers on it, uh, on each card. And I say, you know, I want you to do a binary search or a dictionary search on, uh, on these, and I want you to find the value five. Now, the issue here is I, I've, I've said you have to do a binary search on these. And you flip them over and you find, oh, well, that these, these guys aren't sorted. So you're gonna have to sort them first, right? But you only have to do that once. Once you have those cards sorted, now you can find values more efficiently from that point forward, correct? You sort it once and now it's kind of good to go. Yeah. So how would you go about sorting it? So let's think about uh, an algorithm. So I, each of you is holding 30 cards. I think that's the number we used last time, right? So you're holding 30 cards that are not sorted. How would you go about sorting them as a human being? If I say put these in order, what would you do? Go ahead. Okay, so kind of start splitting them up into little piles, right? You know, where you kind of have the smaller numbers over here, then the little bit bigger ones over here. And so maybe you kind of pick seven or eight piles and, you know, it's going to kind of depend on what the range of numbers are that are in there. Well, no, there's 30 total numbers. But what if the numbers are in the range of uh, one to a billion? Random. Randomly selected numbers between one and a billion. All right, uh, so you get the really tiny text on some of the numbers because it won't fit on the card. But so now, what's considered a small number is arbitrary. Oh, 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 okay, okay, I got you. So rather than going through the cards and say, okay, well, this is between one and ten, put it here. This is between ten and twenty, put it here. You're saying, okay, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna split this guy up into a bunch of single piles. So maybe three piles of ten, and then you'll sort, you'll sort just the first pile. Okay, so now I have ten cards. I'll re-ask my question. How am I going to sort the 10 cards? Okay, so I got the 10 cards. Okay, fine. You don't want to do all 30. That's okay. So now I want to sort just the 10. Go ahead. Um, you could do, if it, yeah, if it's the safe one, for the day, you could do, uh, you could sort them by uh, num number of digits. So one, two, three, up to a billion and 10 digits. Okay. And then you would sort those, each pile, each pile into a Okay. Um, now remember, we're we're trying to come up with a very specific algorithm that we can apply over and over again. Okay. So so you uh, so we have one to a billion. That's a big range, right? So what? So and you want to split them into separate piles? Okay. And what do you? So how many total piles do we have? One to a billion is the range of values we have. What's the maximum number of piles we might have in, in your, your algorithm? Okay, so you're going to do it based on the number of digits in the number. So all the single digit numbers go in one pile, all the two digit numbers go in another pile, all the three digit numbers go in another pile. Okay, fair enough. So now I have 10 piles sitting in front of me. And those piles are similar to each other. So over here in this far left pile, I have a bunch of single digit numbers in no particular order. Okay, how am I going to sort this? Just do it? Just do it, yeah. I no <laughs> yeah, I tried telling Python that. I think it can come up a little short. Okay. So I have, I, have, uh, so I have seven cards now that are single digit numbers. How am I going to sort them? Okay. All right. So now we're looking at a smaller subset of numbers. So kind of your, both of your initial approaches are let's cut our values down. So we're looking at less stuff, right? Because a human being can only juggle so many things at once. So now what you want to do is you want to get into the specifics. We're going to look at the top card and we're going to compare it to the card before after that, right? And say, are these guys in the right order? If not, maybe we do some swapping. Okay. Swap some things in there. So as a person, when we're sitting there doing, if we only have seven cards, you can kind of fan them out a little bit and kind of just rearrange them and get them into the right order. And then we say we're good, right? Um, so what we really want to capture here is how did we go about doing that? We need to have a generic solution for that. So what we're going to look at here is a sort called insertion sort. All right. So insertion sort, sort 
says, so we're going to give the high level uh, uh, definition of this, a high level algorithm, and then we'll look at a specific example. Uh, and then you'll write it. All right. So we're going to start at the, well, let's call it start at bucket one in the list. Okay. In a zero index list. So not at the very first bucket, but the bucket the second bucket in the thing, which is index one in uh, Python. And what we're going to do, we're going to bubble that value towards the front of the list as far as it should go. What that means is if I'm sitting there and you mentioned, compare it to the guy before him. So I'm going to look at bucket one. I'm going to say, should this guy come before bucket zero? If yes, swap them. Okay. And then we follow the guy we just moved. So each time we swap, we follow the value toward the front. Keep going until we either should not swap or we have arrived at the front of the list. Okay, at a high level, that kind of makes sense. Move to, let's go increment the starting position by one. So originally we started at bucket one. The next time through we'll start at bucket two and bubble that guy as close to the front as we can. Then we'll start at bucket three, bubble that guy towards the front as much as we can. Start at bucket four, bubble that guy. Till we've run out of things. Okay? And at that point in time, we've addressed each card in our list, each card in our deck, and we've moved them towards the front of that deck of cards as far as it should go. And in the end, our cards should now all be sorted. That makes sense? All right, so now let's look at a visual example of this. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a four, a one, A six, a seven, and a three. All right. And just for visual purposes, this is bucket zero, this is bucket one, this is bucket two, this is bucket three, this is bucket four. All right, we'll change the color of these guys here. All right, so these are our indexes in the list. These are the values contained in the list. So the value at bucket zero in the list is a four. The value at bucket one in the list happens to be a one. Value at bucket two happens to be a six, so on and so forth, okay? This is the guy we want to sort, okay? So we're gonna visually look at um, uh, insertion sort. So I'm gonna need a couple of variables. So one variable we have is probably called LST. So this guy's a, that's our list, right? That's this guy here. Now we're going to have another variable called maybe cur start pause. And we're going to start that guy off at one. Okay. And what that effectively says, I'm going to, we're going to put the value in there, but I'm also going to point it. So we have the visual. So this guy is going to point at bucket one in our list. Does that make sense? All right, so now we ask the question. We're gonna introduce some more variables to the solution as we start seeing a necessity for them, okay? So I'm sitting here at bucket one. First of all, am I at the beginning of the list? Really what I'm saying is, is there somebody before me in the list that I can compare myself to? The answer is yes, this guy's here, right? So I'm not at the front of the list. I have somebody else I can compare myself to. So since that's true, I'm going to ask the question, 
should a one come before a four? Should, okay? So we need to swap those guys. How do we do that? If I want this one to go here and I want the four to go here, how would you pull that off? That's the only tiny problem we're solving right now. Ah, don't go so deep, this is easy. Okay, this is LST at bucket zero, LST at bucket one. I want what's currently at LST at bucket one to be an LST at bucket zero. And I want what's currently an LST at bucket zero to be an LST at bucket one. Create a brand new list. Aren't lists read write? Strings are read only. Lists have the benefit where I can do this. Can't I say something like LST? at bucket zero gets the value of LST at bucket one. I could do that, right? What just happened? I lost my four. Gone, dead, never getting back. So before I overwrite bucket zero, I probably needed to put it someplace, right? Because <laughs> I'm gonna need that in a second because now I wanna put that four back here and I just overwrote it. All right, so we're maybe going to need a variable, maybe called temp. Or maybe you can call it a swap helper if you want to give it a, you know, a, a good, you know, meaningful name in this case. So swap helper. So maybe what we go ahead and do is we say swap helper is going to equal the four. Then we can overwrite bucket four with the one. Then overwrite bucket one with swap helper. Make sense? So we need that one extra variable to not overwrite stuff. Okay, now we might be inclined to say, if we look back at the textual uh, representation I wrote for this algorithm, to go ahead and have this guy chase us down here. Follow that one towards the beginning. But the problem is, is we don't want to forget where we last began our, our bubbling search. Okay, because in a, when we're done bubbling the one as close to the front as we can, we're going to start here and bubble that guy as close to the front as we can. Then we're going to go here and bubble that guy towards the front as, as much as we can. Okay, now one interesting thing here is you notice I keep saying this word bubble. There's a type of sort called a bubble sort. This is not it, which is completely stupid to me. This should be called bubble sort. Each value bubbles towards the front, but it's called insertion sort because that's when the person who came up with it, that's what they named it. It's completely dumb. It should be called bubble sort. <laughs> so, point is, I don't care what you call them. Okay? It's an algorithm that will ultimately get crap sorted. All right? That's what, at the end of the day, what it'll do. And different sorting algorithms have different uh, um, efficiencies. This one. Maybe we can say this sorting algorithm is kind of the linear search of sorting. Okay. Not real efficient, but gets the job done. Because we're doing a lot of crap here, right? We're kind of verbosely going through our list and I, working with each individual card and taking him on a voyage towards the front of the list until we kind of just have everything in place. Fine, the computers are fast. All right, but So we can't go ahead and have this guy follow. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have another variable. I like to call it the follower. And you gotta say that like really creepy, like the follower. Is the follower uh, here? I... Okay, so <laughs> this is the follower. All right, so the follower is always gonna start off at the same place as Kerr start pause did. All right, so we'll go ahead and give ourselves another arrow. But after we did that swap, the follower is allowed to follow. He follows that guy that we swapped towards the front of the list so that we know. So we're always looking at the follower to decide, is there somebody before the current position of the follower? Okay, current position of the follower just went from zero or from one to zero because now it's pointing at this bucket. That makes sense? Cur start pause points at this bucket. We didn't change that guy. The follower followed the one as he moved it, moved from bucket one to bucket zero. So now it's zero. Then we ask the question, are we at the front of the list? We are. Okay. We don't have a guy before us to compare. 
So that one has moved as close to the front of the list as we can get it right now. Okay? So then we're done with this iteration. We're done with that card with the one. So what do we do? We increment cur start pause. We reset the follower to point to the same place. So cur start pause went to two. The follower got reset to whatever cur start pause was. Then we do the exact same thing again. We say, are we at the beginning of the list? Or is there anybody before me I can compare myself to? Yes, there is. Okay. Should a six come before a four? No. We're done. <laughs> We've moved the six as far as we can move it. So, increment start pause. Reset the follower. Start pause is now three. The follower is three. Are we at the beginning of the list? Nope. Should a seven come before a six? Nope. We're done. Increment cur start pause. Reset the follower. Are we at the beginning of the list? Nope. Should a three come before a seven? Yes. Use swap helper to store the seven. Overwrite the seven with the three. Overwrite the three with whatever's in swap helper. Follower follows. Are we at the beginning of the list? Nope. Should a three come before a six? Yes. Swap helper is going to be equal to the six. Overwrite that guy with the three. Overwrite the three with whatever is in swap helper. The follower follows. Are we at the beginning of the list? Nope. Should a three come before a four? Yep. Swap helper is going to be equal to a four. Overwrite the four with the three. Overwrite the three with whatever's in swap helper. The follower follows. Are we at the beginning of the list? Nope. Should a three come before a one? Nope. We're done. Increment curse start pause. Reset the follower. Are we off the end of our list? Yes. We're done. Our data should now be sorted. That makes sense? Okay. So your homework assignment for next class is going to be to implement insertion sort. Implement what we just drew. Okay, what we just went through. So you already know you're going to have a parameter that comes in, maybe called LST. You're going to have a variable called curse start pause. You're going to have a variable called the follower. You're going to have a variable called swap helper. So three variables are going to be needed to pull this off. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about today, though, is the nature of what happens with that list that comes in. Because in the ideal world, what happens? If I pass, if I hand a deck of cards to him and I say, sort these for me, I don't care how he accomplished it, but he goes and does his sort, then he hands the, the deck back to me. He's not giving me a new deck, right? He's giving me the original deck that's now in order. Okay, the old out of the order deck is gone. It's, that's been replaced. So we sorted that deck in place. So we want to understand the nature of lists and how it relates to memory. Let me kind of show you this through some examples. All right, so I'll go ahead and get ourselves started for our insertion sort. All right, so we're going to have a function called insertion sort, and this guy is going to take a list as a parameter. All right, now all I'm going to do here is, just to show a quick example, I'm going to say LST at bucket zero is equal to five. For no good reason. Just, I happen to be replacing whatever's at the first position, whatever's at bucket zero in, in my list, with a five. Okay? So let's go ahead and let's give ourselves uh, um, a list. And here, we'll steal this guy. That's going to be our list. All right. So we're going to go ahead and just print out our list real quick. I'm not even calling any of my functions. So right now, all my code does is define a variable named a list, 
and it puts a list of six numbers in there. Okay, and then I go and print it. So there's my list of six numbers. Fair enough? Okay. Now, I'm going to go ahead and call insertion sort on a list. And then I'm going to print a list again. Okay, so a list is this guy right here. I print it once and we saw what it was. Now I'm going to call my insertion sort on this guy passing at that list. So that list will get passed in as LST. And all I'm doing in here is I'm taking bucket zero of LST and I'm replacing whatever used to be there with a five, which is different than a 14, right? And then I'm back out here, even though insertion sort did not return anything. I want to look at what the current version of a list is. Current version of a list is now a five. What does that tell us about a list? We want to understand the nature of what happens when a list is passed to a function. So right here, I pass this list to a function. That list came in here under a new variable name called LST, but it's still the same list. I changed that guy, but I never returned it. Yet, there was side effect, correct? We noticed those changes back out here. What does that tell us about what's actually happening here? Go ahead. Mm. We're looking at our evidence here. So I created this variable a list. I printed it out. We're good up to that point? Yeah. Okay. I have a variable. It's a list. I print out the contents of the list. I pass that list someplace else. I don't know what that dude's doing to it. All right. All I know is that I did not say a list is equal to insertion sort of a list. I did not ever, as far as I was concerned, change the value of a list. Okay, all I did was I handed him the deck of cards and you know, a few minutes later, I see the deck of cards laying on the table and I walk back over there and I check it out and it's changed. All right. Let's visually look at what's happening here. Go ahead and steal that from my picture. This is a list right there, okay? Now the reality is, is a list, let's steal this guy, is something called a pointer. Let's say that's memory address 100, for example, okay? Usually it's some hexadecimal thing, so it's like 0x23f or something like that. So, crazy looking memory address. We say that this guy, oops, sorry, points to the beginning of my list. So I'm actually going to move these guys down. I usually draw lists, which are in other languages are often called arrays. I draw them like this. Actually, uh, the reason I like to put 100 in here because it's easy to count. So that is a legal hexadecimal number, 100. <laughs> so this is 100, this is 104, this is 108, this is 112, this is 116. Okay, we'll change the color of those. These are the memory addresses where these values live. These are the indexes in this list that correspond to these memory addresses. So when I say a list at bucket two, for example, what this is actually saying is go to the base address of a list, which is 100. Add to that guy two times the size of the value that we're storing in here. So we're storing integers in here, which are 32 bit or four byte values. All we're understanding here is what's under the hood, 
we don't need to know this to program it. We're just understanding how these things are built. So I'm telling you that numbers like one, three, four, six, seven in most modern languages are represented as 32-bit numbers or four-byte numbers. A byte is eight bits. Eight times four is 32. Okay. So two times the size of a int is four. Okay. So two times four is eight. So this equals 108. Bucket two is that memory address 108. Does that make sense? So we can compute in memory where these things are. Now, Python hides that from us. Okay? We don't have to manipulate memory and stuff like that. This is just what's happening under the hood. Okay? And let me just kind of finish up this thought real quick. Uh, and then we'll talk about it in more depth next time. So what's actually happening out here is when I pass a list in, I'm not passing a copy of this list. Instead, I'm passing at the memory address where you can find a list. And LST points to that same place. So if I drew that picture out here, this is LST. It's pointing in memory to the identical place as a list points to. So when I change bucket zero here to a five, and then this guy ends, a list is still pointing to that exact same place in memory where there's now a five. That makes sense? This is passed by reference as opposed by passed by value. All right, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that next class, but for your homework assignment, we're going to implement insertion sort um, as we discussed in class today. Make sense? And I'll give you... Uh, some of this code, I guess. All right, I'll see everybody on Friday. Oh, in case you didn't notice, if you check on 200 uh, Slack, there's an extra credit opportunity. We have a visiting professor coming to campus tomorrow who wants to just interview like a classroom, like five or six sophomore, uh, freshman sophomores. So if you're interested in a little extra credit, it's at uh, 9.45 a.m. tomorrow in the lobby here. All you have to do is go into a classroom with him with five or six other students, and he's just going to ask you about our program and what classes we teach and what you've learned, that kind of stuff. Nothing formal. You don't have to dress up, but do tell me if you're interested because uh, we do need some more freshman, sophomore folks for that group. We have uh, several junior, seniors, but we need freshman, sophomore. Well, I don't know if you, like, care. But I found